Welcome to the Automation Firehose, Be Strategic and Tactical. Thank you for joining me this evening. In this talk, I'm going to give you some advice on how best to leverage test automation for your team or organization. To do so, first I'm going to touch on an origin story to provide some context on some of the challenges faced in test automation space over the last few decades. In the course of my talk, I'm going to provide you advice on framework and tooling selection, as well as how to schedule your automation into your SDLC, along with the approach, as well as the common challenges that you're going to face along your own journey. But first, let me provide some background information about myself. My name is Thomas Haver. I work as a software engineer. I post regularly on my blog about automation and DevOps along with my team at Red Green Refactor. Before I was in IT, I was a research scientist for around a decade studying molecular fluorescence spectroscopy and microscopy. I am an avid board gamer. I travel around the world to play board games. My favorite is the game Diplomacy, known as the destroyer of friendships. That may have something to do with the reason why I travel around the world to play board games. I'm also an evangelist for Ruby Cucumber. It is my preferred tool to help assist in the implementation of behavior-driven development. I also want to give thanks to my family, my lovely wife and kids, who are remaining quiet during this recording. So let's jump into our origin story. We want to understand how best to implement automation by learning from the past. So let's level set with a shared understanding of strategy and tactics. So strategy is a plan or overall aim to achieve some goal. Whereas tactics is us implementing our available means to achieve that goal. So for instance, Star-Lord here had a fantastic strategy for defeating Thanos in the Marvel Infinities War movie. However, his own emotional tactics cost his team and Thanos ultimately snapped half the universe. So let's take a trip in the Wayback Machine to a time when Microsoft was testing Internet Explorer. Hard to believe, but yes, they did test Internet Explorer. Back in 2004, whenever they had an update, they had to test a variety of combinations across different servers, versions of Internet Explorer, versions of Windows. And this is not to count the 20 different language binaries that they had to also test as well. Even a company as large as Microsoft had great challenges testing these combinations with the automation in place at the time. So the solution that they came forward with is to come up with the most common combinations and put them into buckets to represent customers and test according to those common combinations. Today we would call that persona-based testing. So even with a company the resources the size of Microsoft still had to make that risk-based decision about where to dedicate their people and how to implement their automation. The promise of automation has always been that it's going to save time, raise quality, while also you know, lowering those costs. But I see this as being more of a fantastical offer than something that is realistic because we all know so for some of you from multiple implementations that automation takes time and money to invest in upfront before you start seeing those benefits and done poorly meaning that you're going to have to try to restart and do it over again so going back again to the early 2000s where with Alfred E. Dustin saying that at a certain point in time for an applications lifespan it becomes so large and unwieldy that your test coverage shrinks and it becomes very difficult to actually regression test your application. At a certain point in time, after implementing automation, your test coverage increases, the time it takes to test decreases, and hey, you have better application quality. But it's not just about this sort of magical yellow line that we see here where we implement automation and then we're done. When you're investing in automation, you're investing in it for the long term. So it's going to exist for as long as your application exists. So what does this mean? This means that we need to take care with our approach to test automation. I've helped out numerous orgs with automation and I generally look at these primary categories for assistance. So I care about 
What are their overall objectives? What are the C-level executives hoping to achieve? I look at what is the technical skill set of the people there. I look at our current approach and what we can do to modify that approach in the current SDLC. I look at what framework and tools that I can leverage. What is their current environment? And then also, what are ways in which I can make their automation more reliable and trustworthy so that the teams going forward will believe in that automation as an upfront concern rather than an afterthought. So let's dive into the approach first and foremost. So when you're implementing a test automation framework for a team or an overall approach for an organization, you want to help standardize the approach independent of the people working on it. One of those ways that I found is helpful early on is when you're going into tasking sessions or refinement sessions that you work together with the team to establish a common set of criteria to determine should we automate something. Answering questions as simple as, how often are we going to actually execute these tests? What is the time savings proposition? Is it prone to human error? Is there a lot of data or environmental setup involved? The purpose of this checklist as an upfront is to get people thinking along the same lines of, is this an actually good candidate for us to automate? So that way, we're not automating everything. We're automating the tests that we think are going to provide the most value as a team. Later on, you can sort of drop this sort of sheet to bring into a refinement session or backlog grooming, and it just becomes people's muscle memory kicking in when they're going through and re reviewing a given story. Another change in the state of mind should come about with the way in which we think about automation versus development code. As in, if we're investing in test automation, it should receive the same care that we would expect for development code. That means that we should also consider maintenance costs into the overall total cost of that automation. Maintenance costs such as OS or language upgrades, potentially purchasing third-party software, as well as the cost that you're going to take by investing time in onboarding and documentation and overall maintenance of those test cases. Every time you decide to write a test case and you merge that test case in the main, you are committing to maintaining that test case going forward. Is the maintenance cost going to outlive the cost that you're going to save by executing that test case? So be careful about choosing what you're going to automate and don't hand wave the costs associated with automation when coming up with return on investment. Additionally, you have organizational constraints. So we're always going to be limited by time, by budget, by the technical skill set of the people that we're working with. So therefore, you should take that same risk-based approach that Microsoft took so many years ago that we're going to look at, is it on critical path? Do we have legal compliance? Is there a large amount of data or an environmental setup involved that we can automate away? What we want to ultimately do is look at those tests that are going to provide the greatest value and have a threshold to be reached for a test case to be automated and added into our regression suite. But how do you make this determination of what is a good candidate versus what is not a good candidate and set a priority for work on that given the limited time you're given? What I recommend is using a so-called automation scorecard. In this scorecard, you come up with criteria, what you believe to be the most important things. I, I have an example that I've shown here in a checklist format for a given feature in online banking. And for this feature, we look at things that are on the critical path, that maybe have legal risk associated with them, that have a high degree of reuse, or that we can extend to further flows. You could replace these check marks with a score from, say, 0 to 10 for each one of these areas. And then for the features that you're planning to work on for a given project or initiative, you rank the value that they are going to provide. And then you work from the top of the list down. For anything that you did not get to but you intended to get to, you can identify that as technical debt. Put it on your project tracking board the same way you would for any other defect. You're indicating that you have a gap in test coverage where you think value could be had. So what do we do when we want to look out for framework and tooling? There's no one-size-fits-all for any organization. 
what you're actually looking for is that right fit for your team, for your organization. I'll give an example here. As I mentioned, I'm a fan of Ruby Cucumber. So why would I end up choosing this for you know several different, say, web applications? Well, for one, it uses Selenium, which is a popular open source tool for web automation. Reduces that cost and also increases the odds that people have already have experience to it. Another is that top layer, written in the Gherkin format of given when then. This plain English language means that the automation is accessible to multiple roles in the team and outside of the team, something that you can share with stakeholders to reflect end user behavior. This is a solution, not the solution, but a solution that you can use in approaching functional test automation. So let's dive a little bit deeper into Selenium and why you should think about the tools more closely as it reflects upon your current tech stack. So Selenium has been implemented in pretty much every popular language underneath the sun to help you automate web browsers. When you're selecting a tool, try to align it as best you can with your existing stack. And that is to say, try to align your stack for development code with what you're using for automation, particularly functional automation. So if you're working in a .NET stack, then go with say C Sharp Specflow. This way, you increase the odds that the developers are going to be heavily involved in not only unit tests and integration tests, but functional automation, as well as you're reducing the overall maintenance cost because you have the skills in place and you have people that can go and correct that automation rather than one or two people owning it. Or maybe these are people who are cross team owning across multiple applications. You want to make sure that that knowledge and that empowerment is with the team. So to this point in time, I talked about functional automation. That's not the end all be all, even though I would say it's probably the most popular ones that people will talk about. What you should focus on ahead of that functional automation are integration tests. So ways in which we can connect together bits of functionality into modules. Here's where you get another benefit. F integration tests run more quickly than those sometimes flaky UI tests. They're more reliable than those flaky UI tests. And the framework that you want to use for integration tests are likely also going to match up with your current tech stack, regardless of what your primary programming language is. So you should take integration tests more seriously than functional tests in terms of priority. To logically extend that, if we want the fastest running tests that are going to provide us the best feedback, we want to go with unit tests as the top priority. And once again, Regardless of what language you're using, you likely have a framework in place that you can easily implement and maintain. So this is your first line of defense, and this is something that you should focus on as a top priority. There are several challenges that you'll encounter along the way, either as a team or an organization. So here are six of them that I've seen over the course of my career. The first is the aforementioned automation fire hose. Just because you can automate a scenario, doesn't mean that you should automate the scenario. You want to focus on those that are going to provide the most value. That's why you use an automation scorecard to help determine that priority. What I've seen that often with people is they gain access, say, to a new tool, and they want to use that tool everywhere. Don't fall into that trap. Be smart about your automation, particularly your investment in end-to-end UI-based automation. The second type of common challenge that I encounter is people failing with data. So you write a test case and it works. It's great in that environment. And then as soon as you migrate up to the next level and you deploy your code, your test cases all fail. Why? Because you have no longer control of your data. You're reflecting the wrong database instance. So what do you do in this situation? Well, you have to do this as an upfront, not as an afterthought. So when you come into work on a given story or initiative or project, you want to make access to the data an entry state criteria for your work. The most value you're going to get for your automated test is one that you can write once and execute across many different combinations, across many different environments, rather than solely focused on a single environment. So make automation part of your entry state criteria for access to that data. So that way, dynamically at runtime, you can query the data that you need and 
you should also plan as a best practice cleanup of that data after you're finished executing the test. Another common area where I see people fall into a trap is with flickering or flaky tests. So these are tests that if you hold everything else the same and you execute that same test again and again and again, will pass, fail, pass, fail, flickering on and off like a set of Christmas lights. We want to avoid this. Remove those flaky tests from your execution. Do an investigation into why they are flaky to begin with. In some cases, it's due to your own coding. I know, shock. In other cases, it can be due to the data or environment or the application itself with some underlying issue. Either way, you do not want to have flaky tests included in your automation execution. Why? If you're returning a suite that has 50% failures day in, day out, and it's a different 50% set of failures, then people are going to stop believing in your automation. They will lose confidence and people will stop checking. And then you've lost all that investment you made in automation. You need to keep your suite at a high passing rate by hunting down these flaky tests. Another common area where we see people struggle is with extremely long tests. And I see this most especially with functional tests. So these are tests that are very dense, 300 lines long, validating dozens of things. And when you're trying to read through and understand what these tests are doing, your eyes at a certain point start to gloss over. We don't want to have extremely long tests. We want to keep tests short and simple, very readable and focused ideally on one piece of functionality that you're going to validate. Make sure that your tests are split apart such that they're easily readable by someone, say, coming off the street or anyone on the team who wants to do a quick review. Another area we see common failure is with a shaky foundation. We have all encountered it in our daily to day of we've got a deadline looming, we just got to get it done, and spaghetti codes on the menu. You set it to done, and you've kicked the can down the line here for when you're going to have to fix it up later. The problem is you've got another deadline coming up, and now you have to work on the next feature. Same thing applies to development code, also applies to test automation. So what do we want to do? You want to take the same care with your automation code that you would with your development code. Good development code. So you want to have an architectural runway, as well as practices put in place for your team that include code reviews, refactoring sessions, and agreed upon principles so that regardless of who is writing the test automation, it's the same level of quality. That you've written tests that are meant to be extensible, that functionality is reusable. So that way you don't end up with a giant bloated suite that takes forever to run and is more trouble than it's worth. The last area where I see people commonly run into trouble is automation lagging behind development. So you have automation that's written one sprint after development, or if you're working in the waterfall world, like automation that's written, say, in the maintenance phase or thereafter. We don't want to have this for projects. What you want to do is make your automation feasibility part of that entry state criteria. So you know you've put that automation in scope. You also want successful execution in an environment part of your done state criteria for a story. How can you truly say a story is done if you haven't tested it? Your team should follow that working agreement and it should be supported by your stakeholders. And if they do not, then you need to advocate for the risk that they are going to encounter by defects leaking into production. Having good automation coverage will help improve your confidence level for releases to production. So what are some quality standards that I talked about that we can implement to help ensure that we have maturity for automation long term? To date, I've shown you a lot of Marvel superheroes. Well, here's my own superhero, Mr. Martin Fowler. He said, I'm not a great programmer. I'm just a good programmer with great habits. So what are some habits that we can adopt? Well, one of those is with regular code reviews. Again, the same way we would expect development code to be treated, we should also treat automation code. So what is good automation code and what should we look for in a code review? Well, one is establishing a shared understanding amongst all members of the team about the purpose of that test. That test should be able to be executed across multiple environments. We should have full control of our data as well, and it should reflect the current state of the application. You can have additional team agreements that you want to follow in terms of styling that the other members of the team should review, ideally say in a pull review request or just a side-by-side -side or 
virtual meeting if you need to, to make sure that every time you're pushing a change to main, that everyone's in agreement that it's a value add rather than a risky change. Additionally, I believe you should conduct regular refactoring sessions in your automation uh, code. Ideally, in a once per week basis for maybe 30 minutes or an hour, following the principles of maintainability, extensibility, and domain knowledge. So in these sessions, you want to look at ways in which you can maintain your existing functionality, but improve the state of your code, whether it be through performance, non-orthogonal design, removing duplicated code, or stripping out outdated knowledge. You want to make sure that your automation suite is of good quality, such that if any person on the team left, you could still function and be successful. I found refactoring sessions to also be something that's powerful for sharing knowledge between senior members of the team with more junior members of the team. And that's why I believe you should take to the next step of formalizing those refactoring sessions with roles. This is how you guarantee something is going to be in place regardless of whether you are there or not. So what you want to establish is a leader, someone who's going to schedule those sessions and choose the focus area. This is the person who's going to lead the session for the rest of the team. You also want to pull in a technical resource, a sort of automation oracle, ideally someone from outside the team who can help the team overcome those hurdles if they encounter problems, who's going to keep track of the progress that you're making, and generally is that outside set of eyes that, similar to a code review, is going to help reveal the intention of your automation in areas where you can trip up and maybe you're confusing just because everyone on the team is focused on one area and they don't know how to explain that same context to others just yet. For that focus area in each one of those sessions, they can be things from the story of the day to your regression, an upcoming release, activity logs, whatever you want to select for that focus, but have an agenda for going into those refactoring sessions. So you have that demonstrable change of before the session, we were in this bad state in this one feature or this set of steps. And after we've made these market improvements and we have the traceability for those improvements so that as our application grows so too does our automation but the quality remains there so thank you very much for your time today but what did we learn what are some key takeaways for you one of those is the focus for your test automation you should focus on those unit integration tests above the ui and end-to-end -end. It's an easy habit to fall into to focus on end to end and have those cover up where we lack with unit integration tests, but focus on the first two more importantly, because those are the ones that are going to be more robust. Those are the ones that are going to give you the faster feedback. Secondly, when you're automating, you need to look at those tests that are on the critical path. They're going to provide the most bang for your buck, maybe legal compliance or doing a lot of heavy lifting for data. So that way you do a risk-based approach to automate fewer tests, but more valuable tests. And lastly, we're all going to be limited by time and budget and the amount of uh, technical knowledge we'll have within the organization. So you should work within those bounds of understanding that we're going to take that risk-based approach for how many tests we're going to use and what tool we're going to select and the practices that we're going to engage in. Ultimately, we would prefer to have a smaller set of tests, suites, and have those be valuable and informative than a large set of tests with superficial validations that 50% fail. We want our tests to be reliable, to be a high degree of passing, and to be easily extensible. So again, thank you very much for your time. If you're looking for a new job, a career opportunities, Feel free to scan this QR code and connect with me. I'll put you in the right direction. Thank you all and take care.